coming up with the idea of showing you market, right? Was that accurate? And how you came to the idea that this is this is sort of accurate. I mean, the what, what happened was we were short in 2006. We were short a bunch of subprime mortgage companies their equities, and it was very hard to borrow, and um, it was also very expensive to borrow. So we were all excited about this idea, but we really couldn't do it in size. And so we started to think about you know we're going to short the subprime mortgage market, but we've really never done anything in fixed income. So we started to figure, how are we going to do this? And then by chance, as the movie shows, Lipman called and showed up and basically showed me how to short the subprime mortgage market, and then, and then we did it. That's basically what happened. Yeah. Uh, um, any thoughts on the European banks, uh, the current situation? How long do you have? <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, our regulators did two things very well. They forced our banks to raise a lot of capital to be clever. And they also forced them to get the bad stuff off the balance sheet as fast as possible. Write it down, write it down, write it down, write it down. So you know the balance sheets of the U.S. banks are actually very clean and not levered. Um, Europe took a much more hands-off attitude. So yes, the European banks are less levered than they were, but they're probably about twice as levered as our banks are today. And in countries like Italy and Spain and Portugal, the regulators have been very permissive in not forcing the banks to sell off their bad stuff. Um, my personal opinion is that the Italian banking system is insolvent. The entire Italian banking system. Um, I think Deutsche Bank is a disaster. Um, and I still think most of the European banks are undercapitalized, just not as undercapitalized as they were. You want to ask more, ask me more. Uh, what would you say the roles and contributions were of Fannie, Freddie, and Congress in the subprime mortgage crisis? Okay, so I'll reframe your question. Because <laughs> I get this question. The question, as it is often asked, is what do I think that the Community Reinvestment Act, which is, for those of you who don't know, is an act that forces banks to lend to people who they basically otherwise wouldn't lend to? Do I think that the Community Reinvestment Act and Fannie and Freddie were a major contributor to the financial crisis? Fair? Sure. No. Uh, I think the opinion, I find the statement that the Community Reinvestment Act and Fannie and Freddie caused, caused the crisis, which is some people say offensive. Um, it's the only way you could hold that opinion is if you're completely ignorant of what happened or you're just being deceptive for ideological reasons. You know, the Community Reinvestment Act had no role whatsoever because the originators, all the subprime mortgage companies, it didn't apply to them. And the amount of volume that was done so dwarfed what anybody had to buy for the Community Reinvestment Act, it's not even relevant. You know, Fannie and Freddie, you know, at most you could say they set an environment or people wanted to invest maybe too much in housing, but they certainly did underwrite any subprime mortgages. They did buy some, um, but if they had bought none, somebody else would have bought them. So I, I, I don't, I don't think they had really much of a role at all. Not that I'm a big fan of Fannie and Freddie for other reasons, but I don't think they had a role. Yeah. Do you think a lot of the participants in the structured finance market were sort of consenting adults? You know, there's this. The participants in the structured finance market, structured credit market, CDI squares, all that. You know, there's a scene in the movie where there's the guy from the, uh, I think the German bank who's buying the stuff and he has the dinner and, and the talks Asian, about how much. The Asian, the, guy? the Asian guy, but I, I yeah. <laughs> I thought he was working for a German <laughs> bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, my sense was these guys actually knew what was going on. Like, they knew people were picking pools of assets. Some people were betting on them. Some people were betting against them. And the way the government likes to portray it when they put fabulous fab on trial is you are hoodwinking innocent investors. What, what do you think the truth is there? <laughs> Make it what you will. Um, as an answer to your question, 
By the way, the fabulous fab tribe was ridiculous. I mean, he's a salesman, who cares? Um, so it's, it's the last week of August 2007. I get a phone call from my Goldman Sachs salesperson. It's all public, so it's not I'm talking about it there. I get a phone call from my Goldman Sachs salesperson that says, we've got this CDO bespoke, which we've created. Says it's, it's 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 commercial mortgage-backed securities. It's it's like a gobbledygook of garbage in commercial mortgage-backed securities. And he says, you know, we created this. It's a bespoke transaction, so we have the client is long and we're short. That's how these things were created. It's like fantasy football. And and um, he says, we want to lay off some of that risk. Would you like some? Like me, like I put my hands in my pockets because I figured we get picked. And I say, really, what? And so for you to be short something, you have to pay a premium. So I said, okay, so what would it cost me to be short? He says, oh, 2.2% per year. I said, I'll do it at 1 8. He says, we'll come back to you. 10 minutes later, he calls me back. He says, 195. I said, 190. He says, done. He hangs up, and I say to myself, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> so a month goes by, I call him again, and I say, could you bring up the guy who created this thing? I really want to understand this better. So I bring up the guy, I won't say what his name is. He was Fab's boss. Um, and I say to him, tell me what's in this thing. So he describes it. And then I say, okay. I said, you know, you created this, so you were short, but you're still short. Why are you still short? You could have laid this off ages ago. And here's a lesson in life. When you ask a fixed income person a question, they're uncomfortable answering. The answer is always the beta, the theta, the vega, the delta. <laughs> <laughs> because they figure you're too embarrassed to say what the hell you're talking about. I'm never embarrassed. It's a flaw. Even therapy can't cure. <laughs> and so I say to him, let me see if I could translate what you just said to English, and you tell me if I got it. So I said, so you got all these different types of pieces of paper in this thing. And really, the only question is, what's the correlation of loss between all the various different types of paper in there? Because if the correlation is very high, that's not a good value. Correlation is very low, that's very valuable to an investor. So you went to the rating agencies to get a rating, and you presented them with a correlation analysis that you knew was wrong when you gave it to them. Because you knew the correlations were actually higher. But you figured the rating agency, they're such whores, they'll do whatever you want. And so that's what happened. They gave you a rating based on the right correlation analysis but the wrong correlation analysis. So therefore, if your real correlation analysis was correct, there was an embedded loss in this security the minute you priced it off of the wrong correlation analysis. And that's why you stayed short. Is that what you did? And he looks at me and he says, I don't know if I put it quite in those words. <laughs> and so then my trainer says to him, all right, now we know why you're short. Why the hell are you giving any of this to us? It's like being short diamonds. And he says, oh, he says, because you know it's a bespoke transaction. So before you, the only people in the transaction were the client and us. But we give the price. So now it's you, the client, and us. So we give the client a price that he doesn't like. We thought, listen, there's somebody else in the deal. We gave him the same price. Now you take from that what you want. It's an ugly story. It drives me insane to this day. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a few to uh, follow up on a question. You mentioned uh, rating agencies, and I haven't heard your thoughts so much on their level of culpability. It's hot. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, the rating agencies were um, paying about three to five times more to rate securitization than they were for rating straight debt. So they had every incentive um, to keep the game 
gone. That's, that's basically what happened. I was wondering if you'd be able to, able to, willing to say a word or two about fintech. Any flavor of fintech you'd be willing to comment on? Fintech. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Unregulated agencies have reforms been made. There have been really no reforms of any real significance. Um, they're on their best behavior now because they're watched much more closely, so they behave differently. A lot fewer securitizations done, so the opportunities for this stuff is smaller. But there's been really, as far as I can tell, really no real change, as opposed to the banks, which have really been changed. Yeah, uh, going back to the banks and, uh, and their uh, their own uh, leverage going into the crisis, do you feel that the repeal of Glass Steagall uh, a few years prior to that was a material factor, or was it not so much? Uh, I, I feel very strongly that the repeal of Glass Steagall had absolutely no role. Even, you know, even the people in Washington who would like to say we want to reimpose glass steagall even they don't think it had a role. Um, you know, when you think about what happened, the originators were all non-banks. Um, companies like Bear Stearns and Lehman and Goldman and Warren Banks were major participants. Um, everything that happened would have happened the same. I just don't, I mean, you could argue whether glass steagall on its own was a good idea or not. Feel that it was a good idea or not, but it had really no role in the financial crisis. You know, when I would say to people in, in Washington who talked about you know, breaking up the banks, you won. They're, in terms of you know, how powerful they are and how they function, they're shattered at their former selves. You just move on, it's a waste of time. Yeah? If the global economy is no longer in crisis, why are central banks setting interest rates as if it is? Because it's pretty crappy out there. There's no oomph. And you know, keep trying to you know, get it going by doing this quantitative easing when their governments are doing austerity. So they sort of feel like they're the best game in town. I, I sort of have a very perverse way of looking at it in that you know, quantitative easing has made the stock market go up. So it's helped the 1% feel better. Is my political science, take it for what it is. Nothing happens in the United States when the 1% is happy. So the best thing that could have happened is not do quantitative easing, have the stock market go down, people realize we really have structural problem, and then maybe we would do something. But as long as the stock market's going up, it's not gonna happen. That's the downside of quantitative easing. It's like a band-aid that makes people feel better, or at least some people. So to follow up on that then. As you can tell, I'm a little left wing. Right, well, yeah. so quantitative easing in the U.S. is in theory ended. I mean, what, what happens ultimately when the, the cheap money goes away? Nobody knows. Okay. I mean, there's nothing to, there's nothing to compare it to. There's no, there's no history on it. We'll find this out together. <laughs> Kumbaya. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. So, um, you talked earlier about uh, the debt that we leave to our children, but. I didn't talk about it. Well, <laughs> I didn't talk about it. <laughs> um, so, with respect to the suppression of the interest rate, um, what about the demographic you know, impact on the elderly uh, as a big part of the consumer market? Is that. Well, that's one of the reasons. One of the reasons why the economy has no hope because most people in the United States don't invest in the stock market. They take their money, they put it in the bank, which they get nothing. So the savings rate is higher because people have to save more, um, which is not a positive for the overall economy. It's one of the negative side effects of quantitative easing. Yeah. So where are you finding the value in the market today? Growth is going to be really slow. Well, you could come invest with me. <laughs> give you my call. It's <laughs> <laughs> got a whole move to schnick. separately manage accounts, long, short, only charge one and a quarter percent. I go up a Walmart as a hedge fund. <laughs> Every day, low price. Nobody's even close. <laughs> yeah. If Paulson or Bernanke or Dragon were here today, what questions would you have for them, or what would you say to them in the wake of the crisis? <laughs> You know, they did a terrible, terrible job pre-crisis. Just god awful. I mean, just
this is embarrassing. You know, my favorite quote that Paulson and Bernanke both said in crisis was, the subprime, the subprime crisis is contained. To which I like to respond, yes, it was contained. Contained to planet Earth. <laughs> but, but once the crisis happened, they did the right thing. They did. I mean, you can quibble about it. Um, you know, some of the details. Um, I certainly would have put, I would not have put Neil Kashtari in charge of handing out money to banks, but that's a pet peeve of mine. But that's small things. They did a pretty good job post crisis. Chairman Yellen, <laughs> stop it, <laughs> stop it already. You know, it's quite, I think there'll, there'll be, one day there'll be a reckoning, I don't know what that reckoning will, will be, but uh, it's quite the baby that have to stop it. Yeah. Along those lines, she's uh, a few times made reference to the possibility of negative rates as some, some, some not rates. It's not gonna happen. That'd be such a disaster for the banks. It's, it's a little challenge. <laughs> what we can do to our banks at this point, negative, no banking system was ever set up to deal with negative rates. It just doesn't work. And by the way, um, rates being so low is very bad for insurance companies and pensions, which is another topic. Anybody else? Yes? Should we be more concerned about the loss of wealth uh, from middle income people that, that, were, that suffered from the collapse? I think the biggest problem in the country is the bad distribution of income. Uh, I actually think that's, that is, you want to talk about what, what's the, the prime cause of the financial crisis? It's actually that. That instead of our, you know, the best conspiracies are the ones that are unspoken. And the conspiracy that exists in our country, that existed in our country, really, from Clinton on, was that the distribution of income was getting worse and worse, and people were not making any more money on an inflation-adjusted basis. And rather than deal with that, what we did was covered up with what people like to call the democratization of credit. And it's that that led to the subprime crisis. I think that's the, the prime problem that we have that our country has today. Yeah? How, how much do you think, uh, when it comes to trade, I know that's a huge really a topic these days, but when we look at sort of trade and jobs going abroad, how much does that affect? I think it's a big contributor. I think, you know, people like Joseph Stiglitz have a real point that we trade in Trade. You know, when you go to when you go to college, you actually think you learned something. You take everybody takes Econ 101 and they tell you about how you know you got one country that's good at making butter, another country good at making guns, and let's trade, and everybody gets richer. You walk out of that class and you go, it makes a lot of sense. I actually think that I know something. And you know what? It does make sense in sort of very gross terms, but economies are composed of people. And some of the assumptions in that argument are all those people in the butter country who make guns, who are going to retool them to make butter. And you know what? They don't want to make butter. They want to make guns, because that's what they were brought up to do. And so our establishment, Democrat or Republican, we screwed our people with these trade deals. We really, really did. We did nothing to protect them. You know, there's nothing's inevitable in this world. Look at Germany. They're, in, they're a, a developed country. They still have an industrial base. They protected their people. We, 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 we didn't do that at all. And both Republicans and Democrats are equally to blame for that. Like I said, left wing. <laughs> One more. Who's got it? Yeah. Brexit. Brexit. What about it? Impact. What do I think? Yeah. I'd be more I'm worried more about intellexit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Italy. Uh, you wanna you wanna get a little I get you a little nervous because I'm good I, I I can make people nervous. <laughs> I'm really good at it. So here's what might happen. Might happen over the next couple of months. So there's a referendum in Italy that's going to take place I think the first week of December. The current Prime Minister Renzi is trying to reform the Constitution. You don't need to know the details. He has said publicly that if the referendum does not pass, he will resign. As of now, it looks like the referendum is not going to pass. If that happens, the government will fall. There will be new elections. The, the current 
party that is leading in the polls in Italy is called the Five Star Movement. The Five Star Movement leads in Italy, and you'll and that's what may happen. I hope I've made you sufficiently nervous. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here.